My name's Conrad Steiner. I'm a doctor of medicine. Tonight's story has the title, All My Mothers, All My Fathers. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. To the profession of medicine, to the men and women who labor in its cause, this story is dedicated. Our presentation tonight, the field of pediatrics and otolaryngology, science of ears, nose, and throat. The object in point, a homemade rag doll. The case in point, Patricia Jeanette Dunbar. Her story has its beginning more than five years ago. At the time, Patty Dunbar was scarcely six months old. She swallowed or was made to swallow a quantity of lye. No one's certain how it happened, but it's conceded that it was not a childhood accident. A child of six months usually cannot administer to itself. But the point of the story is not the possible commission of a crime, but the presentation of an actual medical case, how it was treated, and how it was finally resolved. This is where it started. A general hospital, a landmark in the world of medicine, one of thousands scattered across the breadth and width of America. This one is located in a large city, and like its smaller counterparts across the nation, it's an institution founded, maintained, and operated by members of the community for the health and welfare of all. Expert medical treatment and care without cost to those unable to pay for it. A focal point for medical research. A center of learning and observation. A common meeting ground for hundreds of private doctors in the community who give their time and services without charge. The general hospital and what it signifies extends far beyond the medical profession alone. It's a reflection of an entire nation, its people, and the basic philosophy of living to which they subscribe, the dignity of the individual, the value of the individual human life. The present instance, a human life, small, neglected, alone. Dunbar, Patricia Jeanette, age approximately six months. Approximately? A couple of kids in the neighborhood found her in a vacant lot, that's all we know. Take her on up right away, will you, to Ward 11,000. The initial examination of the six-month-old baby reveals a history of severe burns of the mouth and throat, apparently brought about by the administering of an extremely caustic substance, probably lye. The esophagus had been completely blocked off by the scar tissue which had formed over the wounds. A passageway from the mouth to the stomach no longer existed. General neglect of the child has resulted in malnutrition and bilateral otitis media, an inflammation of the middle ear. Both ears are draining. Initial treatment includes special intravenous feedings to treat temporarily the dehydration and nutritional problems. Injections of antibiotics to combat the bilateral ear infections are also administered. After consultation with doctors in the general surgery section, a gastrostomy is performed. It consists of making an opening in the abdominal wall into the stomach to allow for the direct administration of food. The patient's condition continues to remain critical. Five days after she was admitted, the hospital social service staff succeeded in locating a relative of the child, her maternal grandmother, Mrs. Pearl Johnson, age 64. And you have no idea where we might contact Patty's mother? No, doctor. I don't see much of my daughter anymore since she left home. That's been about two years ago. Would you happen to know the name of the doctor who attended your daughter when Patty was born? Doctor, I didn't know Rose was expecting. I didn't even know when she got married. She never even invited me to the wedding. Well, do you, uh, do you happen to know where the father might be staying? Uh, I don't know where he is. He took off and left three months after you married, Rose. 
I don't know where he is. I don't even know where she is. All right, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you very much. Doctor, do you think it's serious? Well, it's serious, but it's not completely hopeless. The food can no longer pass from the mouth and down through the food pipe and into the stomach. Patty's now being fed through a new opening we've made directly into her stomach. Will she have to be that way all the rest of her life? I think there's a chance the damage might be repaired. We'll have to wait until she's a little older in better physical condition before we attempt any corrective surgery. Uh, what about that condition in my ear, Doctor? Well, apparently Patty's had this condition for some time. Two of the men attending her have examined her already, had x-rays taken. They're ear, nose, and throat specialists. They'll keep a close watch on her. They say she'll be all right? Well, there's quite a bit of scar tissue in both of Patty's ear canals because of the infection. Patty seems to be what we call a keloid type. Her body has the tendency to form excess scar tissue. Does Patty yes. have any other living relatives that you know of, Mrs. Johnson? No, Doctor, I guess not. Nobody but me. Well, now, I don't want you to worry. We're going to take good care of you. My daughter Rose. Try to kill her own baby. Can you imagine such a thing? Rose has been raised right. I tried to do the best I could by her. God knows. Trying to kill... Why would she do such a thing? Why would she do such a thing? Trying to kill her own baby. There's only one person can answer that, Mrs. Johnson. Your daughter Rose. Two months and three days after Patty Dunbar's admission to the hospital, a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is performed. Removal of the adenoid tissue is designed to improve the drainage of the ears by way of the eustachian tube, the canal which joins the ear with the nasal passage. The patient is kept under close observation. There is no noticeable improvement in her condition. Patty Dunbar remains in the pediatric section for a full six months. Local treatment to correct the bilateral ear infection continues. So does the treatment of her nutritional problem. At the age of a year and a half, after more than 11 months of treatment, care, and observation, Patty is transferred from pediatrics to Ward 4000, the ear, nose, and throat section, for more intense treatment of the disorder in the middle ear. This is grandmother's baby. Brought this here for you, so you have something for yourself. See the dummy? See the dummy? Yeah. See the dummy. So under the same roof which has sheltered her for almost a year, Patty Dunbar comes to find a new home and new friends. ENT resident physician Max Pearson. ENT surgical nurse Marion McGinnis. Intern Walter Coleta. ENT ward clerk Bell Sanderson. Ward Supervising Nurse, Gertrude Morgan. There is also Carolyn Basserman. A ward patient for the last year and a half, Miss Basserman is a victim of epidermoid carcinoma of the mandible, cancer of the bone, which has necessitated the removal of her entire lower jaw. Spoiled, that's what she is. Oh, it's a new ward, new people. It'll take time to get her used to it. She needs discipline, that's what she needs. She needs love. Don't you think so, Miss Bassman? Poor little thing. What's the matter with you? The esophagus is burned out. The caustic line. It's a bad ear infection, too. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is Patty. Uh, Certainly a cute uh, aren't you? Hey, that's a pretty uh, looking grip you've got, Patty. You want to take a swing at me? Huh? Move back to the treatment room, will you, McGinnis? I want to look at her. Spoiled. Spoiled rotten. Oh, I don't think it's that bad. She needs attention, that's all. She needs all she can get. No family, no mother. She's got more than a lot of children have. She's got a grandmother. Not anymore, she hasn't. What? Grandmother died four days ago. Cerebral hemorrhage. She's all alone now. 
She doesn't belong to anybody. Not to one living soul. Miss Morgan, would you put her next to my bed in the ward? Or I could sort of read to her and things like that. I checked a new set of x-rays this morning. Chronic bilateral infection of the mastoid. Not much doubt about her keloid tendency with all that scarring. More than 50% closure of both canals. If it keeps growing, she'll lose her hearing. That's right, Coletta. And as long as there's infection, the scar tissue will keep on growing. First thing we have to do is clear up the infection. What would you say is indicated here? Bilateral mastoids? That's very good. We had a consultation with the attending men after we saw the x-rays this morning. That's what we decided on. Simple mastoid procedures in both ears. We'll get in there and remove all the chronically infected bone, allow it to heal. And if it doesn't? We'll worry about it when it happens. Schedule her for surgery as soon as possible. After her arrival on the ward, Patty Dunbar enters the ENT surgery for the second, but by no means the last time. During the four and a half years to follow, she will lie on the same table, under these same lights, seven times. In this second procedure, simple mastoidectomies are performed on both ears. Chronically infected areas of the mastoid bone and surrounding tissue are removed. The result of the surgery brings only disappointment. Both ears continue to drain. The infection is now not only in the mastoid bone, but is spread throughout the middle ear. If allowed to continue, the infection could extend into the vital areas of the brain and result in brain abscess or meningitis. After three months, Patty returns to surgery once again, this time for a modified radical mastoidectomy. In their efforts to turn back the destructive invasion of bone and tissue, the surgeons enter the region of the middle ear. They cut away as much of the infected area as possible without disturbing the delicate bones of hearing and imposing total deafness on a child who has more than her share of handicaps. Another four months pass and once again Patty is back in surgery facing still another phase of the struggle to halt the gnawing infection. Another four months go by, then another four. Patients come and go, but Patty, now three years old, remains. Max, what'd you find out? I met with the attending men. We reviewed Patty's history. Had them check her over just to be sure. What's the word, doctor? What did they say about Patty? What I thought they'd say. Both ear canals closed. If scarred completely shut. So at the age of three years and one month, Patty Dunbar, who has shouldered more pain and physical misfortune than most people encounter in a lifetime, is deaf. Three times in the 18 months that follow, Patty is wheeled into the operating room to face three different surgical procedures designed to reopen her ear canals. Twice the canals are opened, twice they close off as scar tissue reforms. The third time, as a last resort, a hollow plastic mold is inserted into Patty's left ear canal. The experiment is partially successful. The canal remains open, Patty regains partial hearing. But the ear continues to drain. Patty is growing up. She's now five years old and she's found still another friend, 
a new patient on the ward. Her name's Linda. She and Patty will be bosom friends for only three months. Their friendship will have to make up in depth what it lacks in length. At the moment, this is very disturbing to Patty's old friend. It's Anderson, I want you to talk to Patty. She isn't fair. Well, she's been like this ever since Linda came. She just isn't fair at all. Patty, what's this I hear? What have you been up to? There. You see how they are? They won't even talk to me. That Patty's getting to be nothing but a little snob. You know me, Sanderson. I try to get along with everybody. Well, I was Patty's best friend when she first came here. I tried to do everything I could for her, make her feel at home. And... Don't be upset, Miss Bassman. Well, I think Patty's just trying to tease you. Well, she shouldn't tease. I don't tease her. I've been nothing but a good friend. Now she goes around snubbing me. She won't even talk to me. Mrs. Anderson, you know that's not right, don't you? It just isn't fair. <laughs> and besides, those are my fashion magazines. Patty? Well? I'm sorry, Miss Bassett. Come on and play with us. You're, you're sorry? I was just teasing. I love you. For Patty, the happiest days of all the five long years she lived on the ward were the six weeks that followed. The residents and interns provide most of Patty's toys. The ward nurses, as they have from the day she was admitted, continue to supply and maintain her wardrobe, including costumes for Patty's special duties, which, while avoiding her arch enemy, Miss Morgan, she performs extremely well. Among these duties are Patty's ward rounds. Her long experience with pain and fear fits her perfectly for the role of Angel of Mercy. What's the matter, little boy? Nothing. Um, want me to sing to you? Tell me the story of Jesus. I love to hear things I would ask him to tell me if he were here. Things by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus. Tell them to me. Birthdays are never overlooked. If there's a party going on, Patty finds it by instinct. Whether it's on the 17th floor or in the basement, she makes it a point to be present. Especially when it's Miss Bassiman's birthday. Parties are fun for Patty, even though food is a strange and confusing subject. The real nourishment for her body is a specially prepared formula injected with a large syringe through the hole in her abdominal wall, directly into her stomach. But the absence of an esophagus has by no means destroyed her taste or desire for real food. Ice cream and cake are her favorites. She might not be able to swallow, but she can still enjoy their taste. So a week follows week into midsummer. Then one day, the staff is shaken by some very disturbing news. They knew it was inevitable, but it's nonetheless disturbing. The welfare authorities and the juvenile court of which Patty is a ward have started interviewing prospective foster parents to adopt Patty. No one disputes that it's for Patty's own good. She can't live the rest of her life on Ward 4000. But giving up a child after raising her for five years is always difficult, even for this practical and realistic medical staff. The days to follow are shadowed by the imminent loss of Patty. And Patty is blissfully unaware of a shadow far darker which gathers above her own life. Here, let me help you, Doctor. Quick, move right up to surgery. Did anyone call Dr. Roman? Yes, I did. He's on his way up. All right, let's make it fast. Patty, just what do 
you think you're doing? You get back to bed right away. I just look at Did you hear me? I said get back to bed. Did you hear me? Back to bed. That's most of her things. Miss Baker's getting the rest of them together. Thanks, McGinnis. I made some fresh coffee, Doctor. Would you like a cup? Yes, thanks. McGinnis said it went fast. But she was gone before we got up to surgery. Five years old. Poor little girl. We knew it was coming, just a matter of time. Finally happened. Massive hemorrhage. We did everything we could. It wasn't enough. Did you see the parents yet? Yes, I talked to them. It wasn't easy. Doctor, where is Linda? That's Linda's doll. Patty, come here. Patty, do you remember what I told you when Linda first came to stay with us? Where is Linda? Do you remember what I said, Patty? I said Linda would be with us just for a while. You'd play together, you'd have your parties, you'd be good friends. But it was just for a while. Well, she's gone now, Patty. She said to say goodbye. She said she was sorry, but, but she had to leave. And one more thing. She said, tell Patty not to cry, because I'm not going to cry. That's the truth, Patty. When Linda left, she didn't cry. I'm not crying, Doctor. At first, the days are many and lonely and long. But time is still the great healer. And Patty's young mind gradually recalls less and less of the little girl with the blonde hair and the pale blue eyes. Finally, after almost six years of hospital life, the big day arrives. Patty Dunbar is ready to leave for the outside world and a home and parents of her own. After long and thorough investigation, the Welfare Department and Juvenile Court authorities have approved Patty's adoption. There is a strong possibility that with age, Patty's keloid tendency may lessen. It will then be possible to attempt surgery to construct a new passageway and reestablish the link from Patty's mouth to her stomach. By the time she reaches her teens, the chances are excellent that she will be a normal youngster leading a normal life. Today she stands on the threshold of that new life, a day of great excitement, great adventure. But for her friends on the medical staff, all her mothers, all her fathers, the departure has its element of sadness. Goodbye, Patty. Goodbye. Good luck, honey. God bless you. Goodbye. You be a good girl, Patty. We'll miss you. Goodbye. Listen, honey, take care of yourself. Don't you forget to come back and see us. I will. Goodbye, Patty. Goodbye. Patty Barnett's long fight for life and her ultimate victory was made possible by community support of one general hospital in one American city.